Hey guys, this is Dr. Calkins. Uh, we're going to cover experiment two, a uh, method in a scientist madness. The scientists were uh, really worried about was Robert Boyle back in the 1600s. He's the one that gave us this whole idea of scientific method. The reason for scientific method in the first place was to make sure uh, we have proof to some of our ideas. If you remember back to the 400 BC, Democritus said that the world was made up of atoms. And about 100 years later, Aristotle made it famous and he said, uh, sure. The atoms are even indivisible in that situation, meaning they couldn't be divided further. And for over 2,000 years, that was the case. And it was the case because scientists didn't prove or have to prove what they thought. They just had somebody famous say something and then people believed it. So nowadays, since the 1600s, we have um, ideas. So again, we're going to have to worry about asking the right kind of question. Maybe it's from our curiosity of how things work or a better understanding of how things work, whether it's medicine or viruses or who knows what these days. Um, in order to answer those kinds of questions, we have to use life experiences on how things work or investigate it in the library online, that kind of idea. But usually at that point, you're going to have a hypothesis on how things work. A hypothesis is just a educated guess. It's something that we're uh, aiming our experiments towards by testing them, so it's a possible explanation. And what we do in lab all throughout the semester is experiments to try to help figure out, uh, are those hypotheses good, can we make them better? Um, and if they are good, can we make them even better um, than they were? So experiments are things that require observations, collecting data, that's what this lab book is gonna be full of throughout the semester. Um, that's gonna lead to some kind of analysis of that data, whether it's by questions or calculations. Um, those are either going to support or contradict the actual original educated guess called a hypothesis. If it con uh, contradicts the hypothesis, we're going to have to go back and do more experiments. If it's, the, uh, if it's something that supports the hypothesis or our data is leading towards the same thing that we were guessing, then sure enough we're going to come to a conclusion, but even then we're probably going to go back and do more experiments to get a better handle on uh, the answer uh, and improve our hypothesis. After this cycle goes round and round and round for uh, sometimes decades or hundreds of years, maybe we can get to a theory, maybe shorter, depending on the idea. But a theory is going to summarize some natural law. So a theory should explain a law. Theories are things that um, recognize something on, you know, that goes on in the world and uh, how that thing works. So say the throw in apple up in the air and return to the ground, the idea is gravity. That magnetic field is pulling us back to Earth for those uh, larger mass kinds of uh, things. And then eventually that theory versus law, again a law is a measurable relationship. It's explained by a theory if it's a good one. doesn't mean that that theory can't change over time, because they definitely do. Uh, and then that's where more experiments come in to fix those theories and improve those theories. So our job in lab today is to practice the scientific method. So we're gonna to have to first come up with a hypothesis, do some experiments, analyze that data, do more experiments, and come to a conclusion. We're definitely not gonna reach any kind of theory, but we are gonna look at some chemistry laws uh, in the end. So we're gonna get ready for lab, so I'll see you in a few minutes. All right, so here on page 10, what we're doing is, uh, tell me the top part, part A. Our question is going to be, in which soda does ice melt faster? So the first thing we want to do is try to use our life experiences from restaurants and uh, going out to eat and think about you know, sweet tea versus unsweet tea or soda versus diet or regular and that kind of situation. So using our background knowledge, what do we think may happen? So the first thing we want to do is provide an educated guess. Do we think a diet soda or a regular soda would melt ice faster and I'll give you a few minutes to put that in now. So once you've picked a hypothesis, uh, we might say that uh, diet is going to melt faster because it has less sugar. Maybe you have the reverse idea where regular soda has more sugar. So now we need to test it. So in order to test it, let's test a diet soda versus a regular soda. First we need to get them to the same temperature because we don't want somebody to have a head start. So as we look over here we have our experiment set up. We have our tongs so we don't prematurely melt our cubes with our fingertips. We have our two beakers and our two sodas. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and pour the sodas and then get back. All right, so now we have our diet and regular soda measured by temperature, both 22.3 degrees because they're both at the same room temperature. So now we're going to add our ice to our sodas at the same time. So one, two, three, go. And we're gonna come back to when they melt and after they feel, in this case, the thunder. All right, so I saved you about 10 minutes of your life you'll never get back by uh, fast forwarding. And notice here, four minutes, 35 seconds on diet. Almost double, or over double in this case maybe, um, we have regular that goes almost 10 minutes at nine minutes, 27 seconds. So whether your hypothesis was right or wrong, now we have to fix it. So to come back to our lab book, we're gonna have to go down and think about, did our hypothesis, uh, was it supported or contradicted based on our previous data? Once you've circled that, we're gonna go down and provide two reasons that you think might be the case. So if you were in that situation where you said diet was going to be faster, you're on the right track. If you said sugar was faster, now we know that uh, the sugar of the regular, maybe that was the, uh, the opposite kind of idea that we were looking for. But maybe you think it's maybe some aspartame or some, maybe they put some extra salt or something. So those are the kinds of things we can put down here to try to better um, figure out what's going on. There's lots of ingredients in both. Maybe some of those ingredients are affecting it. A lot of students might think that salt is the biggest contributor to ice melting because they use it in the winter. So those are kinds of ideas that you can put in your improved hypothesis down here and I'll give you a few minutes to try that. So one of the major uh, improved hypothesis ideas are gonna be, it's probably ingredients. So let's test some ingredients by testing water, the control. So no added ingredients there. Uh, we're gonna have some sugar water, some salt water, and some baking soda water. So we look over here, we already have the same amount of water, which was 100 mils as our soda. Up here we have our uh, 20 milliliters of sugar our 20 milliliters of salt and our 20 milliliters of baking soda. We're measuring milliliters for a solid. It's gonna be good enough for the purposes of IntroChem. So we're gonna go ahead and add these in and stir them up. And unfortunately, when you stir things into water, something that we'll learn in our solutions chapter later in the semester, quite a few things get warm, cold, or stay the same. So as we stir these, we're gonna notice very quickly that baking soda, when you put it in the water, it can get three or four degrees colder, uh, maybe 10 to 15 degrees colder, depending on how much you stir, how much dissolves. So as we stir these, we're gonna to have to pay attention to temperature. And only when they're at the same temperature can we start to test them. What you'll find out pretty quickly too is sugar is super water soluble, that's why you can put so much sugar in things like soda. Uh, salt pretty soluble. Obviously the ocean's got a lot of salt in them. Um, it may or may not go completely clear when we're done. And then baking soda is really never going to go anywhere other than it is going to get about 10 degrees colder, which is a problem because we want all these within 10 degrees before we test them. So I'm going to come back when that's ready. All right, so now we need to gather the temperatures now that we've stirred them and let them equilibrate to room temperature. So we're going to pan over and get your temperature for uh, water, 21.8. So about room temperature like the soda. Sugar didn't really do much, 21.4. Salt, uh, 20.6, actually got a little cooler. And then baking soda got so cold that we had to wait quite a bit to get it warmed back up, uh, but now it's within reason of the others. So now we're going to get some ice and do this exact same thing, time on how long it takes for them to melt. All right, so next we're going to add ice to these temperatures of solutions that are, uh, and then water, that are roughly the same temperature. So instead of embarrassing myself by grabbing all four because I don't have four arms like Goro in Mortal Kombat, I'm gonna skip ahead to that step. All right, so our last column on time, now that the ice is melted. So as we move across from bottom to top of our chart, we have our baking soda, seven minutes, 25 seconds. We have our salt at a whopping 10 minutes, 53 seconds. Sugar, about the exact same time as we had uh, for our soda. But then look at water five minutes and two seconds. Most students are gonna think that salt is the winner. We put salt on the roads all the time. But that process of adding salt to ice makes homemade ice cream, so it actually gets a whole lot colder, so that 10 minutes is actually expected. Salt on ice gets ice cream so cold that it wants to freeze. But notice in the end, water the winner. 
Take a few minutes to think about that as we move to the bottom of the page. All right, so if water is the winner, we need to figure out why. So we're gonna test just water and just sugar because that's the major difference between diet and regular in the end. And if water is winning, the easiest way to tell is to see where the melted ice cube goes by using some colored cubes. So we're gonna take these colored cubes and drop them in to some pre-made solutions. I went ahead and did that for us. I went ahead and added the sugar, stirred it in, got it to room temperature, or at least within reason to each other. So for our control water, we have a 21.8 degree temperature. For our sugar water, we have a 21.4 degree temperature. So definitely close enough to be uh, pretty accurate. Again, we added that same amount of sugar as we did it earlier. So what we're gonna do next is again, add those colored cubes. So in this situation, what we're going to do is gonna to have to stir. So I'm gonna come back. All right, so we're gonna add our colored cubes. One, two, three, go. And then we're going to stir them about as fast as we can until they're gone. So this is a student favorite experiment because this one goes the fastest of all of them. And we'll come back when it's finished here. All right, that didn't take too long. Uh, one minute, 45 seconds for just water and one minute, 56 seconds for sugar water. So in this case, as fast as you can stir, it's gonna melt. So that didn't really help us because the color is throughout. If the color's throughout, that means our energy was doing the melting and that's why it was so fast. So we're gonna have one more step to try. Our last experiment will be to not stir in the ice that has food coloring at all. And let's see where that color is going to concentrate. So I'm gonna set that one up and I'll be right back. All right, so now we need to get a temperature of these last two. Um, again, they already been the sugar's already been stirred in because we needed that to be a homogeneous solution. Um, we have our ice waiting. We have our temperatures recorded for normal water at 21.5, and then our sugar water at 21.0. So about the same temperature, but this time we're going to let those colored cubes sit and see where that color actually goes. So I'll come back for that. All right, so here we go. One, two, three, and we're going to let them sit. We're going to come back to see where that color goes, but this will take a while. So what we want to recognize first after the ice is melted is the time. Uh, water wins again, four minutes, 39 seconds. Sugar water, uh, almost double again, uh, as expected with the soda in earlier. And from the top, it looks perfectly the same as the last one, like we almost wasted our time. Well, this part also has observations because as we move down and look across the beakers, now we know the answer. Check out all the color on top. It's almost as if it's not even mixing, other than that first initial plunge, it's not even mixing with the sugar water. So what we're actually seeing the entire time is if you have a solution, the intermolecular forces that we'll talk about later in the semester are so strong that the ice melts on top and stays on top, the melting ice cube itself produces the water that now insulates it and takes almost twice as long. So that sugar has such a strong interaction with those water molecules that we're seeing it not really even mix. That cold water stays next to the cold cube, making it last so much longer. And then over here, very dark throughout. This is because water is getting now mixed with water. It's interacting with molecules that are exactly the same with no extra fancy glue like with that sugar that we'll talk about later in the semester to deal with. So as we finish this little portion, we wanna sketch what we just saw on this back page. We wanna sketch that in uh, water, it gets green throughout. But with sugar water, it stays in a very fine line on top with a relatively uncolored lower portion. And as you look at that across the bottom, think about how that shows up in restaurants. Think about how that shows up in our daily lives. And the last thing you want to drink is what's on top. So what kind of invention do you think was created in order to get around this chemical principle of solutions not wanting to mix? The straw. Question answered. So now let's go to the questions. All right, as we look at the last couple questions to wrap up, we're gonna try to label some variables. An independent variable is something that is changed by the experimenter, which means you. So in this experiment, what did we change in order to get the outcome we wanted? 
What are things that we added to those solutions to change the amount of how ice melts or the speed at which it melts? In order to know that answer, we would then get this answer for free because this one depends on the independent variable. So if it depends on the independent variable, that means that the things that we put with the water depended on the amount of time that it took the ice to melt. So think about things up here with independent variables like the uh, salt, sugar, baking soda. But now down here, think about the time that changed because of the sugar, baking soda, or salt. Lastly, the control variables, and we use quite a few. A good experiment should always have plenty of control variables like the same size ice cubes, uh, testing against water to make sure that there is a change, size of the ice cubes to make sure that we don't have a large cube versus a small cube, and then testing the temperature before to make sure that nobody gets a head start um, or a slow start. Lastly, our fourth question, if we were to mix oil into water and then throw in ice, what would happen? Well, something unique would happen. Ice actually floats on oil. Oil would be underneath it, but then water would be underneath it. So as the ice melts there, what would be so unique is the ice would actually drip through the oil, re-meet with it. So it'd still be longer than uh, just water and ice, but it's definitely going to be a more unique scenario because of density. And that's it for this lab.